Happy Sabbath, everyone. And we want to welcome you to the Wellington SDA live here from sunny Florida. We want to thank you for logging on this morning to our worship service. And wherever you are at this time, whether in the comfort of your home, whether you're uh, under a tree, or wherever you are at this time, we bid you God's blessing and God's peace. You had a wonderful week. And that um, in spite of the current situation, that God's favor was upon you. We hope and pray that you have, as you've logged on this morning, you've come with great expectancy. And we hope and pray that you'll be blessed by this morning's study session. As of always, friends, we want to encourage you guys, if you have not subscribed to the church's channel, that you will go to the YouTube um, channel and type in the Wellington SDA, and that you will uh, subscribe and click the button, the bell for notification. It lets you know when we're live or when we've uploaded video. Also, we want to encourage you guys to go to my YouTube channel. Um, you go to YouTube, type in Carlton Knott, and you subscribe. And this is why there are some sermons that I have done, recorded, that may not be uploaded on the church's channel, but they are also on my channel. So I want to encourage you guys, subscribe to the channel, click the notification, and as we upload sermons, you'll get notification of them. And also, share the link with your friends, your co-workers, your, your family members, that, that they may be blessed by the wealth of information we have on this channel. We're also asking that if you have not uh, sent us a link in regards to the study guides that we offer, that you may do so at this time. We ask you guys to send us a link at info wellington at sda.com or see not at the final movements.com and we'll do our best to get these study guides out to you. Every lesson we have, it is a study guide. And the study guide helps to guide you and that after the link is over the session, you can also re resort back to these lessons. So again, send us the link and we'll do our best to get these lessons out to you on a timely manner. Also friends, um, we go live also at five o'clock this afternoon when we'll con conduct and continue our Bible study session entitled context and the crisis so you don't want to miss that study hour and again friends as we're about to now transition into our study i want to leave you with a thought the hymn writer says if your body suffers pain and your health you can't regain and your soul is almost sinking in despair just remember in his words how he feeds the little birds take your birds to the lord and leave it there we're going to have a word of prayer now we're going to move right into our study session Please pray with us. Loving Father in heaven, we want to thank you, dear God, for your goodness and your mercies towards us and your grace. We thank you for keeping us safe through six days of toil and labor and brought us once more to your holy Sabbath day of rest. If we are honest, Lord, we have all transgressed our holy law in word, in thought, and in deed, and we do seek your forgiveness, and your strength to come out of weakness. And now, Father, we have come with great expectancy to hear a word from you. We ask, even now, that wherever we are, you will breathe upon us your Holy Spirit. May he come and enlighten our understanding and bring clarity and comfort to this message. May we see Jesus is our prayer in his precious name. Amen. All right, all right. We are about to move into our study session. Lesson number five, the seer, the seer. And this is the fifth installment in the, our study entitled The Desert Lessons. Our thematic text for this series is Romans chapter 15, verse 4, which says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have H-O-P-E, hope. And we do need hope in this time of hopelessness. Our thematic quote is taken from Testimonies of Mr. Gospel Workers, page 31, where she says, We have nothing to fear for the future, except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul says, Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples. 
and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. That word examples, we know it means typology. And as we study the history of the, of, of the Israelites, we see a type, we see a picture of our own journey from Egypt, which is sin, to the heavenly Canaan. We're admonished that we should um, study these three scriptures um, at least once per week. Psalms 105, Psalms 106, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, because we're told, because it rehearses the history of ancient Israel. Now we're going to move right into our study. We're filling in the blanks. Again, we're using the method of instructions, uh, uh, um, question and answer. And we're filling in the blanks. In some cases, the red, and in some cases, the yellow. All right? Question number one now says now, what instrument did God use to deliver his people from Egypt? Let's open our Bibles. Let's take our Bibles out of the book of Hosea. We hope we all have our Bibles, preferably the King James Version Bible. Hosea chapter 12. Let's go to Hosea, please. Hosea chapter 12. We hope you're marking these texts and highlighting them. Hosea chapter 12 and verse number 13. Hosea 12, verse 13. And the Bible says this. Pardon me. We need to move that chair. Just move that for me, please, okay? All right, thank you. Hosea chapter 12, verse 13. It says this. And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. And so the instrument that God used to deliver his people from Egypt, fill it in now, the answer is a prophet. Fill it in, a prophet, not P-R-O-F-I-T, but P-R-O-P-H-E-T, a prophet, a prophet. God used a prophet to deliver ancient Israel from the Egyptian bondage. Note. Not by prophets, plural, but by a prophet was Israel led and also Israel was preserved. That word preserved, we get the word preservative. The reason why uh, bread and canned items can remain so long on the shelf in the supermarket is because of the amount of preservative that is placed in these items. If one removes the preservative from these items, then these items have a proclivity to spoil, to rot, to, to, to decay. And so the prophet was, was the preservative that God placed in the movement as they traveled from Egypt to the earthly Canaan. Right? Preserved during the journey from Egypt to the borders of the promised land. Now, in the first Exodus, we're going to look at the spirit of prophecy in the first Exodus. Now, who was that prophet? Who was that prophet that God used to deliver and preserved uh, Egypt as Israel, rather, as they traveled from Egypt to Canaan? Let's go to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter uh, 2, verse 10. Exodus 2, verse 10, and I have a typo. Instead of Psalms 105, verse 26, it should really be Psalms, uh, where am I? Psalms 77, verse number 10. So please make that correction, please. Instead of Psalms um, 105, 26, please put Psalm 77, verse number 10. Exodus 2, verse 10, the Bible says now, And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she called his name Moses, and she said, because I drew him out of the water. Moses. Moses was the instrument or the instrumentality that God used to deliver his people and to preserve them. In Psalms 105, Psalms 105, it should be Psalms 70, it's, pardon me, it's a typo again. It sh should be Psalms 105, pardon me. You have Psalms uh, 77 verse 10, but it should rather be Psalms 105 verse 26. Again, David is now rehearsing ancient Israel's history, and he said now, he sent Moses his servant and Aaron whom he had chosen. So the instrument that God used, fill it in now, was the prophet Moses. He used Moses as the instrumentality. Now it's amazing, friends, that when you look at Moses, let me back up. Um, we know that Jehochebed, was it Jehochebed? Jehochebed's Moses' mother, um, uh, she had a son. And we believe that she named him. Um, she didn't call him Moses for the first few years of the child's life. Um, he had an original name. Now, we don't know what his original name was. I've actually read the Talmud 
um, some parts of it uh, in, in research. And the Talmud actually gives what they perceive was Moses' original name. But it's amazing that all through his life, he still carried the name Moses. It was given by an Egyptian princess. And Moses' name was actually named after the river Nile because after all the Egyptians, they worshipped the Nile. But it's amazing that all through his, his adulthood, he never resorted back to his original name that his mother, Jehokabed, gave him. Until the day he died, he was still called Moses. And even today, even in Judeo-Christian circle, a heathen circle, he's still known as Moses. I find that very, very interesting and also fascinating, right? So there was Moses. Note now, in order to speak to the people and lead them, he placed in the movement, fill it in now, in the movement, the gift of prophecy, friends. This is important now. He placed in the movement the gift of prophecy. Acts 7.38. The Exodus movement was led and preserved by Christ through the human instrumentality of Moses, his prophet and spokesman. I want you to follow me now, right? The movement would have gone to pieces on many different occasions if it had not been for the gift of prophecy that held it together. It was actually the crazy glue, the gorilla glue, for lack of word, that held the movement together. Without this divine gift, the Israelites would never have left Egypt. And after leaving Egypt, they would have never reached Canaan, but would have returned to the Egyptian bondage. Friend. So the gift of prophecy is right played an important role in, the, in their extraction, in their preservation, and in their inheritance of the land of Canaan. And as it was in the type, friends, so it will be in the anti-type in these last days. Now, friends, this is not in your handout. I couldn't actually get it in, but I've actually sketched a few uh, points, highlights of Moses' life. You may want to take a picture if you can, and, or you can write fast right now. Moses, even though Moses is dead and gone, several hundred thousand years ago, over 4,000 years ago, probably Moses, Moses died, right? But even today, not in your handout, right? Moses, even today, is still revered by Jews, Christians, Muslims, and even the world. He's still revered. He's still respected. He's, in some case, even venerated. As a matter of fact, the, Jew, the Jews, remember Daniel had said in the book of Daniel, and Jesus had said it, that when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, which was the Roman standards, uh, stand in the holy place. That is not inside the temple. But what the Jews had done, when Moses had died, they did not know where he was buried, but because they loved him so much. The Bible says that they mourned 30 days after he passed. The Jews actually cut off certain furlongs outside the city, and they had dubbed it holy. Why? Because they believed that somewhere out there were the remains of Moses. So they, 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 they really venerated Moses. Even the Christian circle, you'll find that you'll find more movies made about Moses and, and cartoons than any other biblical character, the life of Moses. Even the Muslims, even the world, friends, you'll find the world um, talk about, well, didn't Moses say, and so forth. He is still revered and respected even today, right? The Bible also says that in Numbers 12, 3, um, that he, Moses, he was a very meek and a very humble man. He was a very meek man. Now, he wasn't born meek, but as he drew closer to God, this meekness overshadowed his roughness. He was a very meek person, and meekness is not weakness. It is really strength under control. Now, when we said he was a meek person, it, meant, it, meant, it means a person who, who has himself or herself under control. Friends, the greatest evidence of Christianity is self-control. Self-control. Um, meekness means a person who says... A person, a, a person who says, not, not my way, pardon me, but God's way. He, he relinquished his way so God's way can get the preeminence, right? It means a person who does not insist on his rights 
over other people's rights. So he was a very meek. And I'm praying, friends, that as we, as we go through these lessons and as you go through your own Christian journey, that we will develop this level of meekness. And again, it is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control, right? Moses, on the on other on on hand, he was a very learned person, a very educated man in military, right? Very learned and very educated. Acts 7, said he was learned in the art. Most educated, uh, advanced people in that surrounding nation. Even today, the pyramids. We still marvel how they made the pyramids. As a matter of fact, I've read somewhere historically that the Egyptians had even learned how to harness electricity, maybe solar. So they were very, very advanced in their technology. And so Moses now had the opportunity to be taught by, quote unquote, the world's greatest mind at that time, a very learned man, a very educated man, a man who was, who was schooled in the arts and the rudiments of the Egyptian craft, right? Also, Moses, we know, wrote the first five books of the Bible. And he also wrote the book of Job while he was in his Midian experience, right? Moses is actually, believe it or not, he is the most quoted biblical character. You'll find more reference of Moses than any other character that is mentioned in the Bible, right? And not just that, he lived a full life. Moses lived to be actually 120 years old. A long life, brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 34. 34, I want to show you something. Go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 34. Let's go there. Let's take our Bibles. Deuteronomy chapter 34, right? Look what the Bible says about Moses in verse number 7, right? It says, And Moses was 120 years old when he died, right? And the Bible says, His eyes were not dim, interesting, nor his natural force abated. So from this we can deduce, it was not old age or heart attack or stroke or coronavirus, for lack of a word, that brought Moses' life to an end. Moses still had a lot more mileage left on him. The reason why Moses had to die because Israel was about to enter into the land of Canaan, right? And as a result now, they, Moses could not cross over. And we're told in the spirit of prophecy that had not Moses committed that sin in, in, in striking the rock, all right, a second time, Ellen White says God would have crossed him over into Canaan and he would have been translated to heaven, right? And so now the reason why I, 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 I highlight Moses, because Moses was 120 now. If you were to, if you were to divide um, 120 by uh, 3, uh, we'll get three sets of 40, right? Three sets of 40. Now, so Moses' life can be divided into three sets of 40, right? And 40 years is a generation, right? Now, the first 40 years of Moses' life, we know he was in Egypt. He was the, the, the son of Pharaoh, right? The second 40 years of Moses' life, we now find him in the wilderness. And the last uh, quarter of Moses' uh, life, that another 40 years, we find him as a leader and a deliverer of God's people. The first 40 years, he's in Egypt. The second 40 years, he's in the wilderness. And the third 40 years, we now find Moses as a deliverer and as a leader of God's people. Now, let's break it down now. Friends, I believe that we can see in Moses' life our life. These three sets of 40 represents stages in our life as we make our journey from sin to the heavenly Canaan. Now, let me put it this way. Now, you can jot it down, right? The first 40 years in Egypt, Moses, he thought himself, he thought he was somebody. Isn't that right? And friends, you know, sin has made us puffed up ourselves. And we really think we are somebody because we have a little degree and We've migrated to America and we, we have a little money in the bank. And so we really think we are somebody. So in the first 40 years, Moses thought that he was somebody and that even God would use his plan of deliverance to deliver his people. But then we find now the second 40 years in Moses' life, God now had to 
teach him that he was a nobody. So you find now in the wilderness, Moses now went from being a somebody to being a nobody in obscurity. Nobody knew him. And friends, God is trying to take us from where we think we are somebody to a nobody to learn the lesson of humility. And I love it now. So God will take you from being, from you, you thinking you're a somebody to being a nobody. And look at the last uh, 40 years of Moses' life now. We find now God showed Moses what he can do. I love it with a somebody who realized he's a nobody. Hallelujah. Let me say it again. God showed Moses what he can do with a somebody who realized he's a nobody, friends. And that's God's plan for our lives. He wants to divest us from this we think we are somebody to bring, being, bring us to a nobody. Then God can now show us what he can do with a somebody who realizes he is a nobody. Now, friends, as you look at Moses' life, we could spend a whole year, a whole lifetime just isolating parts of Moses' life. But we want to focus at, at, at one aspect of Moses' life and use as a platform now as a study. Moses was the instrument of reform. I want you to follow. Now, remember in our, in our previous lessons, we learned that God had put, separated Goshen from Egypt. And that was, God, that's, that was where they, they should have lived. But after Jacob died now, what happened now? But by the end of the fourth generation, right, the Israelites, Israelites were so in dense darkness and idolatry that they, that they were no different than Egyptians. So they had mingled, they had left Goshen, gone into apostle, everything that they had learned, they had lost. They had lost knowledge of their true God and his truth. And they gradually adopted heathen custom, brothers and sisters, till they, be, they were almost heathen themselves. They had forgot the God of their fathers. Everything that God had given to Abraham and Isaac and Joseph was lost, brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, let me show you how bad it was. Go to Leviticus 19. Now, this is, this is now post-Exodus. But look how bad it was. Leviticus chapter 19. Let's go there. Leviticus 19. This is how bad they were in their Egyptian sin. That Moses even had to correct their behavior. Leviticus 19. 28 says now. Ye shall not make cuttings in your flesh of the dead. Nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Brothers and sisters, they had gotten to a point in Egypt where they had began to print marks tattoos of dead relatives on their body they had began to began to defy the temple of god which was an egyptian practice and and today it is now fashionable the more tats you have the more marks you are you're a somebody no you is a nobody there are, there are tv shows now on on on, on television ink and and tats that that get great reviews where people sit and watch people get tattoos it was an egyptian practice and so here we see that they had even adopted it. This is how bad they had gotten in Egypt. So now what happened now when the Exodus came, we learned that out of the Exodus, there were 2.5 million people. Mixed multitude. A lot of people came out. And so they, 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 they were mistaught. They were messed up in their head. They were in gross darkness. And so as they came out of Egypt now, one of the first things God had to do through Moses was to establish what we call reform reformatory practice. He had to go back to the script, take them back to kindergarten and to re-educate and reorient their thinking. And what God did for the Israelites in the first Exodus, he's going to do, he wants to do to us and through us other people, friends. There must be a revival and a reformation in our own lives. We've got to reform and conform to the will of God. Now, here are some of the, just a few of the reforms that Moses had to institute as they traveled from Egypt to Canaan. And again, this is the type. As it is in the type, so it is in the anti-type. Now, the, the very first reform that Moses had to institute was fill it in now under the guise of fill it in dietary. Moses had to get their appetites under control. You tried leading 2.5 million people. They were eating any and every abomination, but God had to, and one of the very first era in your life, when we're going to study it, that the, the good Lord wants to, wants to focus on and hone is your appetite. And we are told, friends, if we will get the victory over appetite, we will get the victory, we will have the power to gain the victory, the strength over every temptation. But if we fail here, 
we will fail of developing Christian character. Appetite was a stronghold. And that is why just where Adam fell, Christ had to gain the victory. So you'll find that Moses now had to give them instructions as to, as to what to eat, meats. And at one point, he wanted to get them off that flesh. But many of them rebelled. So here we see diet reform. The second reform that Moses had to institute, now fill it in now, was the reform we have what is called social reform. And it's amazing, friends, that these are the same reforms that people are clamoring for today. Social reforms, friends. Social reforms was in the movement. What do you mean? The rights of slaves. Do I have? Yes, you have rights. And people ought to respect your rights. The rights, the life, uh, the life of the unborn, right? And property. Do I just do with another man's property as I choose? No. There were reforms, social reforms, that they had to abide by, friends. The rights of slaves. The, 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 the rights of life, the rights of property. God had, was trying to get their thinking back to this. The, second, the third reform that you're going to find that most, Moses had to institute was, fill in now, in regards to worship. Lord have mercy. Friends, the Egyptian had a rock and roll religion. They, they would jig you all the way. Their, their worship was a lot of bodily gesticulation. A whole lot of shouting and no thinking. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, we had gotten to a point where Israel, in their Egyptian encampment, they were worshipping the right God, but in the wrong manner. And friends, we have come to a point now where we think that we can shout the power down. God is not deaf. And we can't shout the power down either. And it's not how high you jump and shout that God's concerned about. It's how straight you walk when your feet hit the ground. Grandmother would say, empty barrel man still makes the most noise. Are you with me? So God had, and again remember, they had reneged the golden calf. That was the, that was the ISIS, the bull in Egypt. We're going to study it, friends. So you're going to find out in the anti-type, God is now seeking to correct we just don't approach God any and every way. We just don't sing any, any and every song in the presence of God. Are you with me, right? And Moses had told them that the only instrument that should be used in the sanctuary were a string instruments, friends. As it was in the type, so it is in the anti-type, friends. They were worshiping the right God, but in the wrong manner, right? Then we had now another institution that Moses had a reform he had to bring about. Now, you're going to find these in the Exodus was in regards to family. The family circle. We're talking about the marriage, reform in marriage, divorce, family in regards to how, how does children, how should children relate to their parents? You know, out of the Ten Commandments that is written, only one gives a blessing to long life, and that is the Fifth Commandment. And it, in, it, it enjoins children to honor their parents, and not just their parents, to honor now, um, adults, and when I was growing up, friends, honestly, only old folks die. Literally, children would outlive grandparents. But we're seeing now that grandparents are outliving children. And I believe that one of the reasons why many children go to their early graves is because they disrespect their parents' authority. We are told that parents stand in the place of God. And as long as our parents are not leading us in the, in the, in the wrong direction, you are it is your duty to respect and reverence your parents, and not just them, even those of mature age. So here we see, friends, that during the Exodus, one era of reform where Moses had to give attention to was the family, marriage, divorce, and how children relate to their parents, brothers to sisters, sisters to brothers. And I want to read you a very, very solemn statement, friends, and this is very, you may want to jot this one down. We are told, Signs of the Times, May 19, 1881. We are told, yet it, is, yet it is a hard lesson for man to learn that God means what he says. This is serious, friends, right? So here we see reform after reform Moses had to institute. The fifth reform that we find that Moses had to institute in, in, their, um, in their travel was the issue of welfare. Welfare, not a bad thing. Not a bad thing, right? What does welfare mean? It means that there was an obligation to the poor and the unfortunate. They were to look out the widows, those people who, who didn't have it financially. 
there were systems set in place in the Exodus movement for the poor and the needed. Now, this did not take the place of working. And if you can work, you should work. And it is true we have a welfare system today, and many abuse it, and that is not right. And I've read somewhere that the greatest help that you can give to the poor is not money. Teach them to help themselves, she says. Give them something to do, friends. So Moses here instituted welfare reforms, right? Obligations to the poor and the unfortunate. Another reform that Moses had to bring about in the movement now was, in the, was in, under the context of sexual, sexual reform. Sexual reform, we're talking about incest. These were Egyptian sick practices that they had learned, brothers and sisters, right? A very lowest form of degradation and even sodomy. Sodomy, bestiality, uh, right? These were practices that were done in Egypt. And also the menstruation cycle. When that time of the month, how should the lady conduct herself? Uh, you know, was she clean? Was she unclean? What could she do? What could she touch? God in his wisdom had to bring about these reforms in the movement, friends, as it was in the type, so it is in the anti-type. Are you with me, friends, right? One more reform that we see in the movement was the Sabbath reform. Friends, they had lost the Sabbath. They didn't know how to keep it. They were buying and selling getting Kentucky Fried Chicken down in the Egyptian, you know, drive through They were doing all manner of ungodly things on the Sabbath. They had to be taught. And we're going to have a whole lecture on how to keep the Sabbath. Because friends, there is a Sabbath keeping amongst us. As Seventh-day Adventists, which is far into the Bible. As a matter of fact, I, I shudder at it, friends. And wouldn't it be a sad thing for a Sabbath keeper to go to help a Sabbath breaking? God had to reform them in regards to the, the area of Sabbath observance, how to keep the Sabbath, what is the conduct on the Sabbath, what can we do or what should we not do? Are you with me? Right? Another area of reform that Moses had to bring about was on the area of health. And this is not dietary, this is health now. Health in the context of sanitation. Wow. Three million people. How do we handle sanitation? Urine, feces, do they bury it? Do they? What do you do with it? Do they dig a pit? Can you imagine the stench, brothers and sisters? This was the first CDC. CDC will do well to take a page from the life of Moses. That's why we're told in the prophecy that the answers to the COVID virus is in the word of God, friends. There's no drug. This is the answer to the COVID. If we would just obey what God says, right? Infectious disease. It broke out in the camp. Itches and scratches and leprosy. How did we handle those infections in the camp, brothers and sisters? Sores. You know what I'm saying? Lice. You know? How did we handle it? Moses now had to reform them. How do we handle? How do we quarantine? That's the word we hear today. These principles are in the word of God. If we would just get back to scripture. Right? Another reform that Moses had to bring about was on the area of recreation. Come on, friends. They had to enjoy themselves. But there was some recreation that Moses told them they should not practice. And you're going to find Deuteronomy anything to do with witchcraft and magic and sorcery. Could you imagine, brothers and sisters, Moses taking the children of Israel, the AY team, to Disney World, Epcot Center, magic, witchcraft? These things were dubbed and deemed abomination. Moses told them, you should not practice any one of these modalities in the book of Deuteronomy 28. There was, a ref there was rec and there are some recreations we cannot in good conscience practice because heaven condemns them because they are steeped in witchcraft, brothers and sisters. Dominoes, check, chesses, call it what you will. I know some of you don't like it, but it's the truth anyhow. Reform after reform. And then another reform that Moses had to bring about and we're going to say, friends, we're going to cover all of these. I promise you. He had to cover the area of dress. Yes, he had to. The Egyptians were by, try. They put no difference between male and female. They all wrote the same thing. Not in Israel. There, they, there, were, there were no unisex in God's, in God's camp, friends. Male and female. He and she. Different. Are you with me, right? And as with the the, the creation so with the dress. Moses told them, if you're a woman, you shouldn't put on man's garment. Vice versa. Because if you do these things, they are an abomination. Moses had told um, Aaron, 
if you, when you come to my altar to offer a sacrifice, don't, your nakedness should not show. And we have come to a point now where the 11 o'clock hour is one of the most nakedest part in the church's history. Naked friends. It should not be. Moses had to correct that in regards to reform. It's in the Bible, friends. It's in the Bible. One more reform that we're going to look at that Moses had to bring about a, a, a change in them is in the context of business. Wow. It's in the Bible, friends. What do you mean? Buying and selling. Do we use false balance? Do we switch the price? Do we capitalize on person's ignorance? No, to make a dollar. Loans. If you lend a person something, should you charge them interest? Now, friends, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, and, and I'm, and I'm going I'm to keep on saying it until the day I'm translated. I don't plan to die by the grace of God, friends. You know, there's a practice within our, within our ranks. And we, the people, allow it, which is unscriptural. That is under the context of charging interest to your brother. You should not. It is a wicked, it is a wicked principle. It is very demonic. It is satanic, friends. It is all through the ranks of Adventism. We borrow money from the conference to buy a church where they're going to own. We pay them back the principle and the interest, and they take the building. If that's not some Ponzi scheme, some made up, I don't know what is, brothers and sisters, right? So there were reforms. If the man worked, Pay the man the right thing. Don't capitalize on his ignorance. There were reforms even in regards to business. If you borrow, pay back what you borrow. The Bible says the wicked borrow it and pay not back again. You is a wicked man if you borrow don't pay back. So the Bible says, friends, the relation to each other. So you're going to find that there were more reforms. This is a few. I can give you more that God used Moses to bring them back to the faith and practice of his people. Now, somebody say, preacher, number three now, why were these additional instructions given to ancient Israel? Were not the Ten Commandments sufficient? Why would God have to have Moses write five long books? Have you ever tried to read Deuteronomy, brothers I mean, you get lost in the thou wilt and the shalt and thou camest and canst not. Why did God cause man to write? I'm going to read to you from Page Some Prophet now. So you want to read from me now? This is what she says now about the, um, why God gave them these instructions now. She says, If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham, there would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. If, condition. Keep on reading, please. And if, if mm -hmm. the descendants of Abraham had kept the covenant, of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. Mm. They would have kept God's law in mind, mm -hmm. and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai. Or graven upon tables of stone. Stop. Did you get that, friends? It was never God's intent to put the law on no stone. It was God's intent for the law of God to rest and resonate in our minds, the frontal lobe. Keep on reading, please. And had the people practiced the principles of the seventh of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need of the additional directions given to Moses. Here is, friends. It was not God's intent to give them the Torah, these, far, these first five books. If they, were, as a matter of fact, what I'm gathering, that everything that Moses wrote, those first five books, they were embodied in the Ten Commandments. There, there are ten precepts. We're told they are brief, comprehensive, and authoritative. If we would just keep God's commandment, there would be no need for no spirit of prophecy. If, note now, in other words, most of the instructions to ancient Israel through the gift of prophecy would have been unnecessary if they had faithfully obeyed the law and the instructions previously given, brothers and sisters. But they did not. So God now had to force Moses to write laws and statutes and judgment to bring them back to the Ten Commandments, friends. Number three now. Where was Moses told to store his writings in the sanctuary and what were they called? Let's go to Deuteronomy. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Um, Deuteronomy 
chapter. Hold on there. Where is it? Deuteronomy. All right. Uh, Deuteronomy 31. 31. All right. It says this now. Here it is now. God told Moses, take the book of the law. Right? The book of the law. What was it called? Right? Take the book of the law and put it in the what? Sides of the ark of the covenant of your God that it may be for a witness against you. So it was told, friends, don't take these writings lightly. God told Moses in the most holy place where no human beings could go but once per year under the sacred chest, right? Put them in Philadelphia in the size of the ark right here. The spirit of prophecy was placed in the size of the ark and it was also called, another name, the book of the law, brothers and sisters. It wasn't an additive. It wasn't optional. It was a requirement, brothers and sisters. Are you with me, friends? So, so serious that God had it placed in the size of the ark. Are you with me? Right? And so here we had the Ten Commandments, a part of manna, Aaron's rod that budded. But on the outside of the chest, we had the law contained in some of the ceremonial laws and laws of Moses. Now, I'm going to give you a brief history now, right now. Israel had divided into the southern and northern kingdom, right? The northern kingdom, kings of the south, right, were 20 kings. I want you to follow me now, right? We had Rehoboam, Ajiman, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joram. Let's keep on down now. But now. When we get down now to, and this is the time frame now, the BC is counting down, right? So we're getting down now to about BC 715, we find a king come on the sea named Hezekiah, right? Hezekiah. Hezekiah's son was Manasseh, right? Manasseh's son was Ammon, and Ammon had a son by the name of Josiah, right? Now, you'll notice that the, these were the years of the king. Hezekiah reigned for 20, 29 years, and Hezekiah was a good king, a very good king, a very prosperous king. When Manasseh came on the scene, he reigned for 55 years, and Manasseh was unbelievably wicked, friends. He was wicked time, a, a wicked boy born in the church. Wicked boy, right? And then Ammon, now, I'm going to read to you now from Prophets and Kings. And in your handout, look what Ellen White says now about what caused Hezekiah's reign to be so prosperous. She says, please read. Nearly a century before, during the first Passover celebrated by Hezekiah, provision had been made for the daily public reading of the book of the law to the people by the teaching priests. So, so every day, the book of the law was Moses' instruction, the spirit of prophecy. Every day, Hezekiah had made a rule that the priest should read some portion of the spirit of prophecy to the people. Now let me stop there, friends. In your home, you should not let a day go by without reading some portion of the book of the law to your children, to yourself. Friends, if we should not allow Sabbath and praying to go by without the pastors reading a portion of the spirit of prophecy. And you have these unfortunate pastors who don't quote from the spirit of prophecy. Their rationale is, we don't want to confuse visitors. What visit? Anybody coming to your church anyway? Anybody visit your church? You ain't saying nothing really. You can't outdo T.D. Jakes anyway. Brothers and sisters, Every day, they read a portion from the spirit of prophecy to the people. And look what happened now as just by reading the words. Please read it now. It was the observance of the statues recorded by Moses. By Moses, spirit of prophecy, book of the law. Uh -huh. Especially those given in the book of the covenant, uh -huh. which forms a part of Deuteronomy, uh -huh. that had made the reign of Hezekiah so prosperous. Ooh, friends. Hezekiah's reign was like... Well, who we call King Midas. You know who was King Midas? It, 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 it's, a, it's a story about this king. Everything he touched turned to gold, brothers and sisters. Because Hezekiah believed the spirit of prophecy, believed Moses' instructions, whatever Moses said he did, this man prospered. He prospered. These were the golden years of Israel's reign, friends, as it is in the type 
So it being the anti-type. Friends, if you want to prosper, if you want to prosper in your marriage, with your children, in your business, in your life, you've got to, you've got to let the spirit of prophecy be a part of your, of your life. Look what happened now. She says now, prosper. But Manasseh, who was Manasseh? He was the son of Hezekiah. But Manasseh, when he reigned now, had dared to set these statues, right? And during, set aside these statues, and during his reign, the temple copy of the book of the law was lost through careless neglect, had become lost. And for many years, the people were deprived of these instructions. So under Manasseh's reign, Hezekiah was the golden years of Israel's history. When Manasseh came on the scene, that brother went from gold to tar, barren. He didn't have the golden touch. And friends, I'm afraid as a people, we have lost the golden touch. Our pioneers had the golden touch, friends. We are told if we had done what she would have said, the world would have been beaten a pathway to our door. We have lost the golden touch. We could have monopolized all these vegetarians. We could have had a monopoly on health. On health. But we've lost the golden touch, and now we are scrambling to catch up. We've lost it, friends. The, when you see Kentucky Fried Chicken is putting out meatless chicken, you know, and you have we as a people who are still clamoring for the flesh pots, you know we've lost the golden touch, friends. I'm, i got to be clear to you. I'm not beating upon you, friends, but we have lost the golden touch as a people. We're no longer the head. We are, we are not even the tail, brothers. We are, we, we are just, we are, we're not even insignificant. Honestly, friends, not even insignificant. Now, remember I showed you. Let me back up now. I'm trying to make a point now. Hezekiah believed what Moses said. He prospered 29 years. Manasseh came on the scene 55 years. Wickedness. God put him down. The book of the law was lost. When his son came on the scene, Ammon, that brother was so bad. God said, you know what? Two years he reigned for and cut him down. When Josiah came on the scene now, which was the great, 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 great grandson of Hezekiah, the Bible says they were doing some construction in the temple. And one day they heard a little ruckle in a pot. And look what the Bible says now. Jot it down. In, this is in 1 Kings, uh, 2 Kings 2.11. 2, the Bible says that when they found the book of the law, they brought it to Josiah, which his great, 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 great grandfather, I think four greats, Hezekiah had read. The Bible says now, and it came to pass when the king heard, didn't even see it, when he heard the words of the book of the law. Look what he did, friends. The Bible says the man, the king, rent his clothes. His heart bled because he realized and recognized that they had gone so far. Mm -hmm. He just, and I believe if people would just hear the spirit of prophecy more in yeah. our churches, Amen. hear the spirit of prophecy more at camp meeting, yeah. hear the spirit of prophecy more on prayer line and in our, in our schools, yes. in chapel, instead of these little bizarre, weird Egyptian chapel, mm -hmm. they ain't saying nothing. You ain't convicted nobody. He read his clothes. He was convinced and convicted that he was wrong. The book of the law, friends. Powerful. Again, friends, pro the prosperity of ancient Israel hinges and hang on them being obedient to the instructions given by Moses. Now, that was in the first Exodus. Let's bring it down now to our day. 2020. covid Ripping the world apart. Let's now transition to the spirit of prophecy in the second Exodus, the anti-type. In Isaiah, let's go there quickly. Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah made a bold prediction. Isaiah chapter 11. Let's go there. Let's open our Bibles. Isaiah, come on, open those Bibles, right? You know you, you don't open them all through the week. Isaiah chapter 11. Look what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 11. Let's mark our Bible, saying, let's get back to the word of God. Look at verse 11 now, right? The Bible says now, Isaiah says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand a second time. The first time was in Egypt. A second time to recover 
the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, Egypt, Parthos, Cush, Elma, land of Shinar, Halmath, from the islands of the sea, brothers and sisters. There's going to be a second exodus. And what God did with the second, first he did with the second now, right? He lifted up his hands the first time to bring Exodus movement out of Egypt into the earth of Canaan. Again, he was to set his hand a second time to gather the remnant of Israel right now. Number, number, is number four? Number four now says, right? All right. Did the early church now, we're moving now to modern Israel. Did the early church have the gift of prophecy? Did the early church have the gift of prophecy? First Corinthians, right? First Corinthians, number five. All right, thank you. Number five. It's a typo. Number five. Number five, right? Paul says now, even the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so ye come behind in no gift. The early church had the gift of prophecy. What God gave to ancient Israel, he gave to the early disciples. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. The Bible says now, when Christ went to heaven, the Bible says now, wherefore he saith, when he was ascended upon high, he led captivity captive, and he gave what? Gifts unto men. What are the gifts? Now, God gave five gifts to the early church. Here they are now. And he gave some apostles. You see it? He gave some prophets. He gave some evangelists. He gave some pastors. And he gave some teachers. Friends, let me stop there. Look at the gifts. Fivefold gifts. Friends, the order of the gifts are important. Look at the order. The order is inspired. Where do we see prophets, Nathan? Where is prophets on this list? Is it first, second, third, fourth, or fifth? Second. Second is important. The, in other words, friends, the gifts are given based on their importance. And what we have, we have come to a point now, friends, where the fourth string gifts is going to tell the second string gift he ain't important. It's like you have a quarterback. Most NFL teams have three quarterbacks. The fourth string quarterback, he don't see no playing time. And he only gets some action probably when they've just dominated the game or the first, second, and the third string get hurt. But we have come to a point now where pastors, pastor, which is, which, is the, which is the fourth string gift, have the nerve to try to abolish the second string gift. The gift. In other words, where you can do without passage, you can't do without the prophets. You see the parallel, friends. The gifts are important, right? Can, can women, be, women be prophets? Yes, women can be prophets. Acts 21, 18 says that Philip was an evangelist. Philip was an evangelist. And look what, so he was what gift? Philip was the, the third, he had the third gift, Right? And the Bible said now, this same Philip had four daughters. They were virgins which did prophesy. They all had the gift of prophecy, brothers and sisters. So the answer is yes, the early church had the gift of prophecy. Now friends, watch this now. Let's not become confused. Today, a lot of people are calling themselves prophets and prophetess. One of the binding, she styles herself prophetess is she is she in the same league or class as moses does she have the gift of prophecy prophet tb joshua right are these men prophets and women according to the bible friends i think not i think they are pseudo prophets. they are self-appointed prophets god don't know them because the bible says to the law and the prophets the true prophets always keep the law and the last time i checked them folks are keeping the wrong day. The wrong day. As a matter of fact, one of the binding, I know a church who invited her on a Sabbath to preach. She almost broke out in tongues. Yes, not here, here it's a true fact, right? So here we see the early church had the gift of prophecy. Now, let's now look at the wrath of the dragon. Oh, what happened? The wrath of the dragon. My computer went haywire. The let's look at the wrath of the dragon. Question number, what the question is that we're at now? Question number what? Question number six or seven? Question number, I think my question is a little bit off. 
The question says now, please pardon me. I had a little, I don't know what happened here. Right? All right, number six. All right. Question now, with whom is Satan angry in the last days? With whom? The Bible says the dragon, Revelation 12 now. Look at it now, 17. The dragon was wroth with the woman and he went to make war with the remnants of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The devil is only angry at one group of people. Who are they? Here they are. Fill it in. Those who keep the commandments of God. All ten, right? The commandments of God. Right? And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Not Joseph Smith which is the spirit of prophecy. I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. You see all this COVID-19 issue? COVID-19 will find its fulfillment right here. Let me tell you where COVID-19 is headed. Let me tell you. There ain't no vaccine. Forget the vaccine. The vaccine is a smokescreen. This is where COVID-19 is headed. We must find COVID, the COVID-19 will find its embodiment how will the COVID-19 assist the devil in making war against the people of God? It's coming, friends. Right? There it is, right now. The dragon made war against the Exodus movement because it represented loyalty to God and his commandments. The same dragon is wrought with the remnant church because of their loyalty to God's law. Truly, there is a likeness here. Now, Let's now look at the gift of prophecy in the Roman church, right? Please read that now. The gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy played an important part in the apostolic church. All right. Uh -huh. But during the fallen away. All right. Apostasy. The spirit of prophecy with all the gifts of the spirit gradually diminished in their operations during the middle ages of darkness and apostasy. So as the church fell away, the gift of prophecy was withdrawn. Right, withdrawn, right? But until? But not until the Advent message started and began to bring a people all the way back to the faith once delivered to the saints, uh -huh. including obedience to all the commandments of God. Uh -huh. Did the Lord place the gift upon a permanent prophet in uh -huh. the church? We as Seventh-day Adventists like to trace our roots in history. All the way back? following the Millerite movement of the 1830s and the 1840s, all the way back to John Wesley and the evangelical revivals of the 18th century in England, all the way back to the Protestant Reformation, all the way back to the groups like the Lollards and the Waldenses, all the way back to Christ and the apostles. That's why James White says we build on the foundation of many generation friends. Now, number seven, according to the prophet Joel now, we know the gift of prophecy was lost during the Dark Ages from 538 to 78. Now, question number seven now. According to the prophet Joel, what prophetic event in history would signal the outpouring of the gift of prophecy in the last? Let's go to Joel. Joel told us, once you see this event happen, right after this event, look for God to bestow back the gift of prophecy which the early church had which Moses had. Joel 2, Joel 2, 28 says now, And it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall see dreams and your young men shall see visions. Also upon my servants, upon the handmaiden, in those days I'll pour out my spirit. Here it is now. I will show wonders in the heaven and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillar of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible. So what event did Joel say right after this event? Look for God to pour out his spirit. Fill it in now. After the dark day and the moon turn into blood, friends. Right after this event, God says, 
I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, right? The dark day and the moon turning to blood. Now, friends, we know historically, right? We know historically that the darkening of the sun and the moon occurred on the 19th of May, 1780, right? Over New England. So according to the prophet Joel, we should look for the gift of prophecy to be restored sometime after May 1970, 80. Look for friends, it is, isn't it, isn't it? And Satan knew this prophecy, you know. He says, hold on, if God's going to make a move, I must make my move. Friends, isn't it ironic that all within that time frame, all these so-called prophets popped up, prophets by the dozens. Joseph Smith came on the scene. Mary Baker Eddy came on the scene. Helen Blavaxi with her crazy came on the scene. All of them came on the scene. And by the way, um, uh, she, Christian Scientology, Ellen Blavatsky founded Theosophy, which is condemning the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White condemned Theosophy. They, all these were stylist prophets came on the scene because Satan knew God will restore the gift, so he must counteract the true gift. But friends, we must test the prophets. Note, please read on Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists have historically held that God gave three individuals visions in the early 1840s. All right, this is after May 1970, 80. You see the time frame now, right? Who are they? William Foy, uh -huh. Hazen Foss, uh -huh. and Ellen Harmon. All right, let's, let's look at them now, right? Let's look at William Foy. Now, friends, during this time frame, unfortunately, African Americans were not free. As a matter of fact, you'd find in the North, they were free, but in the South, they were not free. Now, you'd find statements like these posted all over in the North. Caution, colored people of Boston, one and all, you are hereby respectfully cautioned and advised to avoid conversing with watchmen and police officers of Boston. For since the recent order of the mayor, Aldman, there are kidnappers and slave catchers. So friends, they would catch a black man that was free in the north and take him to the south. That move with the 12-year slaves is a true story. Now, William Foy was a man born free, living in Boston, right? God gave him the, he and his wife gave him the gift. He was a, 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 a minister. Um, he received the gift. As a matter of fact, he would travel from place to place, but he, would, he was cautious. And his wife was very, very nervous because she felt that if he would go certain places, um, they, 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 they may capture him. And we don't hear much about William Foy. We hear much about anything anyway, right? But William Foy had the gift of prophecy. A black man, brothers and sisters. God gave him vision. As a matter of fact, I, I probably should have put it. I have it in my, in my, in my, my, my library. This is the book. The Christian Experience of William Foy, the two visions, a powerful vision he got about the judgment. William Foy had the gift of prophecy. As a matter of fact, Ellen White would go to hear him preach and teach. Faithful man. He had the gift. Then God, as a matter of fact, there's a book you want to you read. By, it's a good book by Dr. Delbert Baker. Delbert Baker is the, Dr. Baker is, is a former um, school president of Oakwood. When I was there, he wrote a book called The Unknown Prophet. We don't hear much about William Foy in our teachings, and I don't know why, but we should. And you, you, you get this book. Matter of fact, I think it's free on PDF. But it's a, it's a good read about the judgment, two visions that he had in that time frame, right? Then God called another man, Hazen Foss. He was Caucasian. He was white. Man, he could move around. But Will, uh, Hazen Foss says he didn't want it. He was afraid. And God took the gift of prophecy from him. Then now God gave a woman, a young girl, Ellen White. Please read now from 1844. From 1844, when Ellen Harmon was 17 years old, until 1915, when she died, she served for over 70 years in public ministry and had more than 2,000 documented visions. So how long did Ellen White reign as a prophet? How long? 70 years. Friend, did you know that no canonized biblical prophet reigned so long not even moses reigned so long moses was a prophet the last 40 years of his life ellen white is the longest 
reigning prophet in the history of humanity. 70 years, brothers and sisters. That's a mighty long time. Right? All right? Um, okay, where am I now? At the age of nine, Ellen was what? Which reader? During this time, she lived and worked in America, Europe, uh -huh. and Australia. Uh -huh. Her work was often met with skepticism and ridicule, particularly since she was a woman and had not much formal schooling. Uh -huh. At the age of nine, Ellen was seriously injured when a classmate hit her with a stone. For three weeks, she was unconscious, and it was thought that she would not recover. All right. After her initial recovery, she returned to school, but never got beyond the early grades. Mm. On August 30th, 1846, Ellen married James White, a young Adventist preacher. I'm going to tell you something, boy, James White was a bulwark boy. I tell you, man. Keep on reading, please. And they had four sons, Henry, Edson, William, and Herbert. After the death of her husband on August 6th, 1881, Ellen labored alone for another 34 years, during which time she produced some of the most profound writings on God's word. She wrote 100,000 pages, 80 books, 4,600 articles, 5,000 letters which were preserved, and more than 4,000 that were not preserved. That's a lot of writing. Some of us can't write a paragraph. We can write a complete sentence. We use these crazy signals, signs when we're texting. Friends, Henry, Edson, William, Herbert. Edson was named after Hiram Edson, we learned last Sabbath. Two of her sons died, right? Very, very sad, brothers and sisters. And this woman had to leave her family since then, I'm telling you. Now, not in your handout, do you know there is a striking parallel between Ellen and Moses? There is. Some stuff that I just jot down. You can take a picture or jot down. Here they are now, right? There's a striking parallel or a similarity between the life of Moses and the life of Ellen. Here they are, right? Both were prophets according to the Bible standard. They all passed the test. I wish I had time to, to, to teach on the test. We may do it one of these days, right? She passed the test with flying colors. You know, Dr. Trump, President Trump would say the test is, is perfect. It's really, 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 really good. You know, he always says, my, my, my tests are perfect. Like, the doctor says, it's perfect. <laughs> that's, his, that's his word, right? She passed the test perfectly. Her test was perfect. Really, 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 really perfect. She passed the test. All the tests, brothers, from A to Z, right? So both of them were prophets. Not like TB Joshua and one of the Bionides false prophets. She was prophet 101, right? Number two, both had a family. Moses had married a black woman. He had children. Remember, when he was going to Egypt, he didn't circumcise the son, and God almost killed him. He had a family. Yes, Ellen White had a family. And as Moses had to leave his family to go to Egypt to confront Pharaoh, Ellen had to leave her children to travel all over the country to galvanize the people. Tremendous sacrifice. Both had a family. They were, they were not like Jeremiah or some of these single prophets. No. Family prophets, right? Thirdly, both led God's people out of darkness. Moses out of Egypt, Ellen White out of the dark age. Because when 1844 came on the scene, remnants of the dark ages still remained. God helped her to shape the people's mentality. What Moses was to ancient Egypt, coming out of Israel, Ellen White was to us and the Christian world. Powerful, right? Fourthly, both writings are full and complete. Friends, let me tell you something. There's not an era in your life that Ellen White doesn't speak about, nor Moses. She even speaks on animal abuse. So all you animal rights activists, yes. When Balaam was beating the donkey, she actually condemned people who, you, who stone dogs. I used to beat dogs. Wrong wickedness. Wicked sin. They are full. In other words, they are right and speak to the entire being. Some prophets spoke to apostasy. They, both of them spoke to the, Moses' writing is complete from the top of your head to your big toe like Ellen White. They, they, they touch and they, they wrote very vast. Right? Fifthly, both reigned the longest as prophets. 
Moses was the second to reign 40 years. Ellen White exceeded him by 30 years. 70 years she reigned, Moses reigned for. This is history, this is Bible, right? If their instructions were followed, it would bring great blessings to God's people. You know, Ellen White says this. Ellen White said, if we were, I should have brought my spirit of prophecy book. If we, still now pass me one of those books, please, right? Anyone, probably the red one, right? If we, she said, if we were following the instructions in her writings, there would be a new order of being on the face of the earth. They would want to study us. Today, brothers and sisters, our schools are empty. You think Harvard is the thing? Yale is the thing? And they're, and they're not accredited. If we had followed the instructions, right? Right? The instructions in these, in these books right here, friends. If we had followed these instructions, brothers and sisters, there will be a waiting list to our schools. Today our schools are empty. We don't send our kids there. And if it wasn't for step up, boy, we, you know, we'd have been out there in Egypt. Now, you know I'm talking the truth. You know I'm telling the truth. I'm in the line on the Sabbath. Friends, if we had followed these books, brothers and sisters, the world would come and say, there's some Adventists, we need to check up on them because they are healthy. They're not getting infected by COVID-19. I'm telling you, friend, because... We, we didn't follow it. We lost the King Midas touch. Very few of us have the golden touch. Right? Both writings were lost through apostasy. Carelessness in the house of God. The spirit of prophecy was lost in the temple on the um, Manasseh's reign. Friends, there's a generation who grew up, who grew up not knowing the gift of prophecy. Friend, when I was baptized in this church in Jamaica, I didn't know who Ellen White was. I kid you not, did I was a baptized member of this church doing A, Y, you name it. Did not even know who this woman was, friends. I grew up, I, I grew up, majority of my adolescent life in the church, didn't know who she was. And not, a lot of people didn't know who she was. The writings were lost, brothers and sisters, through neglect, right? Both had disabilities. Her face hit with a stone. She was disfigured. Until the day she died, there was a disfiguration. Moses was slow of speech. He did have a speech impediment. He did. But look how God used him and used her. Are you with me, right? Now this, now this one, I love this one. Now this one just gives me, boy, let me want to shout like an evangelical. Both are blessed with a special resurrection. You know, Moses died. We know that. Now, under biblical chronology, Moses should have gotten up when Jesus comes the second time. But you know, right after Moses died, three days after his death, Jesus came to resurrect Moses and took him up. Ellen White will be blessed, which is a special resurrection, because he was a type of the masses. He was the first, I think, to be resurrected. I don't think nobody, nobody came out of the grave. He was, I think he was the first. Yeah, right. Ellen White died in 1915, but she will rise in a special resurrection. Please read now. This is Fourth Spirit of Prophecy, 454. Four. Please read now. Graves are open, uh -huh. and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake. Uh-huh some to everlasting life uh -huh. and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's the text now. now. Here's, here, here's, here's the clincher now. Please read now. All now, friends, where I'm from, all means all. What part of all don't you understand? The A or the L, L. All. Please read now. All who have died in faith under the third angel's message uh -huh. come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. Friends, this, these texts speak to of a partial resurrection. Two I don't have time to get into it, right? But the partial takes place before the first. It's not the same. God the Father causes the partial. Jesus causes the first. The partial precedes the first by a little window. Right? Don't confuse them. The difference is, well, I don't want to get into it because that's not my assignment, but friends, she, she died in faith. And friends, if you die in faith, we, we, we heard that over 41 Adventists died in the COVID-19, probably counting. 
If they died faithful, they claim his blessing. There's a parallel. Now, as we wind down, reasons. Why did God give Ellen White her writings. Why did she write? Couldn't she make knittings or bake cookies like a good old lady? Why write all friends? Why write? Why why write? Lord have mercy, man. Why all this writing? Why not the Bible? One, ten reasons why God gave her the gift of prophecy. To bring the minds of God's people to his word. Note, the spirit of prophecy among God's Burma people does not reveal additional light but calls us back to neglected scriptures. In other words, everything she wrote, it's there. It's right in the Bible. Please read the live sketches. Again, if, condition now. If you had made God's word your study uh -huh. with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain to Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimony. Here it is. You would, we, we wouldn't need his book, brothers and sisters. If, but because we are not, we need all of them. Keep on reading, please. The written testimonies are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the heart the truths of inspiration already revealed. It's already here. It's here. Keep on reading, please. Additional truth is not brought out, but God has, through the testimonies, simplified uh -huh. the great truths already given. Already given. All right. And in his own chosen way, brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them that all may be left without excuse. The very same words of Moses. Put them in this house of the ark that you will, saints, we will have no excuse because you can speak English. And she was in the 19th century. You see when gibberish or gypsy, she spoke English. We are not going to have no excuse. And I'm going to tell you something. The most wretched creature in hell will be a seven-day Adventist. You think Hitler going to have it bad? Be one of these false pastors and false livers in our churches. They, them going to bust hellfire wide open. Right? Number two, to simplify the great truths already given. All the spirit of prophecy does is simplify what is in the King James Version Bible. All it does, right? Number three, to call attention to the Bible principles for the formation of correct habits. In other words, she's all about reform. Just like Moses, we are in darkness. We are in Egypt, midnight darkness spiritually. So the spirit of prophecy now brings about reform. Yes. I consider my life since I was, I was in boy Egypt times too. Fourthly, right, to correct those who err from Bible truth. That's all it does. It corrects you. It doesn't make you a fanatic. You show me one person, the spirit of prophecy has made worse, and I'll stop reading them. It doesn't make you worse. It makes you better. And people who read these writings and come and go off left key. Them need medication. They were already, they were wrapped tight. Them heavens weren't clear. The spirit of prophecy don't make you a fanatic. It makes you reasonable. It makes you intelligent. Fifthly, to specify what is truth. We all know what is truth today. We're preaching all kind of, we're preaching Easter and all kind of fool. It ain't no Easter in the Bible. I mean, you went on Facebook last Sabbath. The amount of Adventist pastor preaching Easter. They ain't preaching the sanctuary. The real deal now is what's going on in heaven. Ain't no tomb 2,000 years ago. Christ ain't in no tomb. Three. The present truth ain't no tomb. Three. It's the cleansing of the sanctuary. Yes. And you have these unfortunate pastors on YouTube. I got to tell you, boy, judge, I'm going to beat you with the belt if you don't stop it. To instruct concerning what is God's, what is God's will for your life. It's, friends, I tell you something. When I left FIU, after coming from Italy, I was, boy, I, I didn't know, I need a directive. When I took the book, Message to Young People, it gave me directive, friends, right? To specify what is man's duty to God. Friends, we owe so much to God. We owe so much to God. Eight, to comfort God's people. When you read these books, there's a, there's a wooingness in them. Nine, to shield God's people from the deception. Friend, they, there is a deception coming upon the world. It's going to It's going to make HD look like, 4K look like, like, like DV. To shield us. And it's, it's not too far from us. To bring the church, to bring unity to the church, causing God's people to see eye to eye, friends, on issues 
that they have the same mind. That was the reason God gave. Please read, I was referred to ancient Israel. I referred them to ancient Israel. God gave them his law, uh -huh. but they would not obey it. All right, now. He then gave them ceremonies and uh -huh. ordinances. All right. That in the performance of these, God might be kept in remembrance. Here it is now. They were so prone to forget him and his claims upon them that it was necessary to keep their mm. minds stirred up to realize their obligations to obey and honor their creator. She said... Had they been obedient and loved to keep God's commandments, the multitude of ceremonies and ordinances would not have been required. Here it is. We don't need all these circumstances and rigmarole. No, we didn't need all that. Keep on reading, please. If? If the people who now profess to be God's peculiar treasure would obey his requirements as specified in, in his the word. In the KJV word. Look what happened now. Special testimonies would not be given to awaken them to their duty. There it is, right? There it is, friends, right? So the reason why God has given me, because, see, we don't read this. The average pastor don't even quote from this. Some of us don't read Bibles in church. And God bless the homes that have devotion. When was the last time you read your Bible? We're not reading, the, we, be honest. We are not reading our Bibles. I struggle reading. And the preacher struggle, Lord have mercy. We all struggle. That's why God gave us these books. To simplify the truths and bring us back to God. So the devil is angry. He was mad with Moses, boy. He was mad with Moses. Number eight now. What is Satan's attitude towards the spirit of prophecy? How, 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 how does Satan view these books? How does he view them? What, 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 let me turn them around. I'm going backward. How does Satan view these books? How, how, how does he view them, Nathan? In Ali, how do, what do you think Satan attitude? Do you think he's happy at them? The Bible says he's angry with anybody who reads these books along with the Bible and the Ten Commandments. He's very upset if you preach from them. The preachers who have it the hardest are the preachers who mingle the spirit of prophecy in their lectures. I'm so let me tell you, I wish I could tell you some stuff that has happened to me, brothers and sisters, in my lifetime. All because you stand for truth and you're not going to leave out the prophetess. What is the attitude? I'm going to tell you as I wind down now. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 9, 9, before time in Israel, watch it now. Here's my title. When a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, come let us go to a seer. Why? For he that is now called a prophet was called a seer. That's my title, the seer. In other words, the prophets were seers. The seers were the eyes. Now, friends, I've oftentimes said this. <clears throat> if I was captured for my faith during the Sunday law crisis and they, 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 they catch me, I didn't get time to get out of Dodge in time. And the, the broad county sheriff, they lay hands on me. I said, "Not. Nah, we've been watching you on YouTube and you're, you're, you're turning the people. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna persecute you. We have three torture missions for you. Choose one. Choose one. Here they are. We're going to either put out your eyes, bust your eardrums, or cut out your tongue right now, right here, at this place. Choose one. Now, friends, I'm going to be honest. This guy right here, I need to see. I'm sorry. I can learn sign language. I can read. As a matter of fact, friends, last week I watched a documentary. I don't know what language they were speaking. The documentary was two and a half hours. It was just so good. Saints, I, I actually picked sense out of the, 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 the thing. Didn't know, there was no caption. There was no word. I just tracked the thing. You know, it's about the Third Reich. I, I'm kind of hooked on Hitler and his goonies, right? But nevertheless, right? Friends, I need to see. I can learn sign language. I can read lips. But this brother needs to see. And I believe, if you're honest, you would choose, you would choose your sight. Keep my sight. The Bible says, 
where there is no vision, the people are not misled or inconvenienced. The people perish. The prophets were the eyes. Now, case in point. Here's an here's a example. This is Babylon. That's Jerusalem. 900 miles. That's from here to about Tennessee. No, about Tennessee. Right? Ezekiel is in Babylon. He's a prophet. There's bad things going on in Jerusalem. Because he's a prophet, what can he do? He can see. God took him in vision and God showed Ezekiel 900 miles what was going on. To the detail, the prophets were the eyes. And the reason why Satan hates the gift of prophecy, Ellen White, right? Because she is the eyes. If you put out the people's eyes, the Bible calls him a serpent. The old serpent. There was a, 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 a thing on PBS, a whole month, full, month, one month full of snakes. And there was one cobra. There was a one snake in particular that they featured. He was called the spirit. Pitting Cobra Nathan. And they say, when he rise up and when he lets his venom fly, the Bible says he does not aim at the limb. He doesn't aim at the chest. He doesn't aim at the feet. You know where he aims at, Nathan? He aims at the eyes. Why? Because if he blinds his prey, they cannot see. It is Satan's plan. To blind the eyes of the church so we can see what is happening all around us. He hates the spirit of prophecy. What is the attitude? Say so not, please read now as you wind down. Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious to lead away from the truth. Uh -huh. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the spirit of God. So his, what was the first deception? In heaven deceive the angels. That was the first deception. The last exception of Satan is to make you lose confidence in these books. Keep on reading, please. Where there is no vision, the people perish. All right. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways. Different ways. All right. And through different agencies. He may use the pastor, conference president, Sabbath school teacher, mother, father, brother. Different ways to do what? To unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. Friends, he wants principals to lose confidence in these books. If the principals in our schools would not just say, would really and truly use the principles, God may you bless, man. Keep on reading, please. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies, which is satanic. Friend, stop there. When you hear a person condemning these books, you'll know them is, a, them is the child of the devil. Judah's second cousin. Did you hear what I say, friends? It is satanic. It is devilish. Anybody who you, and let me say this, you don't have to verbally come out and speak against her. Just don't apply the principles in your life. Six are one, I have dozens the other. Please read. The workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in Churches. Them. All churches, Florida Conference, Bermuda Conference, uh, Bahama Conference, Jamaica Conference, all the conferences. He wants you to lose confidence in these books. When you have your talk shows, don't quote from her. You quote from T.D. Jakes. You, fuck this. Hey, I'm telling you, man. God going to spank us with the belt. You know, there's a church who had the nerve. They wanted the church growth. You know what they bought? Purpose Driven Rick Warren. And they would not buy evangelism by Ellen White. That's a disgrace, man. Keep on reading, please. For this reason, Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions uh -huh. and bind up souls in his delusions uh -huh. if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. Exactly. If you throw out this, he says, I got him. Friends, we are told, if you lose confidence in the testimonies, you will do what, Ali? You will drift from what? Bible truth. So friends, here it is, friends. If you start criticizing this, what's going to happen? Because, you know, see, we don't read this. That's why this was given. Now, let's think now. We ain't reading this. So be honest. You know you're reading the Bible. All right? So God gave us this to bring us back to the awareness of himself and his truth. Right? Now, if you lose confidence in this, by and by, you will drift 
from this in that order. One more. One thing is certain. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner, that's a Sunday law, will first give up their faith and warnings and reproof contained in the testimony. Friends, any seven days, I don't care who they are who lose faith in this. I don't care how much time they return. Rest assured, when the law is passed, they will, they will bow, buckle, and bend to the Sunday law. That's what, and, and this is what the prophet's saying. Unless she's a liar. You want to know if you're, you want to know if, if you want to know if, if, if you're heading to hell this morning? Let me give you the, the acid test if you are on your way to hell. Not in your handout. Volume 5, page 672. She lists five steps to hell. If you want to know if you're on your way to hell this morning, examine these steps. Turn the card over. If you want to know if you're on your way to heaven, here it is now. Number one, it is Satan's plan to weaken the faith of God's people in the testimonies. Satan knows how to make his attack. That's the first step. Number two, transition. He works upon the minds and, the, and to excite jealousy and dissatisfaction towards those at the what? Head of the work. He wants us to lose confidence in organization, the general conference, the union, to criticize, to criticize and criticize. Number three, the gifts are next questioned. Then of course, they have a little weight and instructions given through us to visions are disregarded. Fourth step. Next follows skepticism to the vital points of our faith, the pillars of our, of our position. The question of the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the dead, the dead. Eh, eh. Question it now. Then, number five, doubt towards holy scriptures. Then the downward part March to perdition. That's hell. Five steps to hell, brothers and sisters, in that order. But the first step is they lose faith in the testimonies that God has given to us. So, friends, where are we heading? Well, some of us are going to go to hell if we don't change. But as we go through our, this journey, we're going to see the reforms that Moses gave them in the wilderness and the same reforms that God has given to us, the parallels are striking. Friends, we are in a crisis and things are going to get worse before they get better. And all I can say to you who are watching, wherever you are at this time, if you don't remember anything I have said, I've been speaking now for about an hour and a half-ish, is this. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall he be established. Friends, I beseech you as your friend, as your evangelist, believe the prophets, so shall you prosper. You want to prosper? Friends, you believe the prophets, all of them, and even the modern day one. And then, you know what's going to happen? Once we embrace the writings in our homes, in our churches, in our circle, what's going to happen? There shall be showers of blessings. Send them upon us, O God. Grant to us now a refreshing Come now and honor thy word. Showers of blessings, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing. Now as in Jesus we call. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessings we need. 
Mercy drops around us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Here it is now. There shall be showers of blessing if we but trust and obey. There shall be seasons refreshing if we let God have his way. Showers of blessing. Come on, if you, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops around us are falling. But for the showers we plead, friend, as we believe the prophets, I believe that God will prosper us in this life, yea, in the life to come. Were you blessed this morning? Yes. Praise God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, O oh God, we want to thank you. O oh Lord, for the gift of prophecy, this gift that you have given to us to guide your people through these perilous times of Earth's history. Father, forgive us because we have slighted her books. We have not received her instructions. And now the curse is upon us, O oh God. I pray that you will have mercy upon us, O oh God, and you will help us and our institutions to get back to the counsels you have given to us in the spirit of prophecy. So we can finish the work and Jesus can come is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people say amen, amen, amen. and amen. Friends, we, we say blessings to you. We see you at 5 o'clock um, at um, Context and the Crisis. Don't forget to go and subscribe to both channels. Type my name in, Carlton Knott, YouTube, right? Subscribe, hit the bell, and also go to Wellington SDA. So as we go live and upload these messages, you will get a notification. See you at 5 o'clock. God bless you.